I was down with the no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free.
the Bethel blessing. The Bethel blessing go back to Bethel. The Bethel blessing go back to Bethel. LeBron James is an NBA superstar. The argument is going whether or not he is arguably one of the great or the greatest or one of the greatest basketball players that has ever played the game. I'm not going to argue with anybody about that. You have your favorite. Mike is still my number one. But there was a recent article done that said that LeBron James not only may be arguably the best basketball player ever was, but he may be the best, one of the best athletes that ever played professional sports. He stands at six foot nine, 250 pounds, and at 37, he is averaging 29.7 points a game, 6.2 assists, and 8.2 rebounds, which is unheard of at his age. They put him and Tom Brady, who was 44, in the same category. You do know Tom Brady had retired and now has taken back his retirement and is going back to play for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. This will be his 23rd season. Again, this is LeBron James' 17th season. And he is still putting up those kind of numbers. Phenomenal. But did you know there was a time and everybody who's out there who's done something great can tell you that behind the scenes you don't know what's going on because LeBron James in a recent article interview said that he, there was a time he lost his love for the game. LeBron James. It was 2011. You know, he came into the league already crowned as descending to the throne that Michael had left empty, that Kobe was going for. He came into the scene with all kinds of scrutiny, and for the most part, he was everything they thought he was, except he was getting all kinds of scrutiny his seasons in Cleveland with the Cavaliers because he could not take them far in the postseason. He did the best he could, scoring phenomenally. But it really happened in 2010. Everybody remember the decision? When he said, I'm going to take my talents to South Beach, meaning he was going to play with the Miami Heat, and when he got down there, he pulled together his team that he wanted, him and Dwayne Wade, and they got together, and they were supposed to win the championship. Because when he got to the decision, we're going to win not one, not two, not three. Well, anyway, it came back to haunt him, because in 2011, they collapsed right in the middle of the championship with Dirk Nowinski and the Dallas Mavericks. They lost. Man, people start. People in Cleveland were laughing, people all over. We didn't know the effect that it had on LeBron because we didn't see it. He's been such a winner. But he did an article saying, you don't know, I was broken. My life was sprawling out of control. My thoughts and my love for the game was just not there. He said, but then I made a decision to not just continually train my body, I knew then. I had to train my mind. Who I could preach there. I had to train my mind. Here's what he said. I went back to find out why I was playing the game. I went back and looked at the highlights. And I looked at what made the joy of the game. I looked at the times when I enjoyed it. And I looked at the fact that it was my destiny to play this game. And he was winning ever since. But what he said in that interview is I had to go back to go forward. Not only LeBron James. I love a lot of sports, and one of the sports I love is women's tennis. And there are African-American women in women's tennis who are at the top of the heap when it comes to pros in tennis. Matter of fact, the best woman tennis player there is is Serena Williams, so I can't leave her out of the conversation or her sister Venus. But that's not who I'm talking about. You ought to check out someone named Sloane Stevens. I, I love them all. But when I look at Sloane Stevens, her story excites me. Because Sloane Stevens, she broke onto the world in 2013 at the age of 19, beat Serena Williams in the Australia Open, and moved heavily into the quarterfinals of Wimbledon before being beat out. And you know what's something about her story is she was winning and she was ranked at that time as uh, number five in the world from her phenomenal talent. Then something happened. She began to lose terribly. And going through this streak of losing, 
She finally, it came to a head when she went to Rio de Janeiro to the Olympics in 2016. And when she got there, found out she had a stress factor in her foot, had a cyst on her foot. She said she was going through problems at home, in relationship. She said her grandmother had a stroke. Everything was falling apart. And she just lost her love for this game. She thought it was over. And one day she sat down and said, no, I'm going to make a decision I got to find out why I was even playing this game. She did the same thing. I want to go back and find out where, where was the joy coming from? What happened? I know I'm supposed to play this game. Where was the joy? She hired her a new optimistic coach that told her, make your practices fun. Make your practices everything. Just a part of your life. And when asked how she got herself back into a groove because she went from 957 in the world where she had fallen to number three in the world. Now she is ranked, and that's in singles, right now she is ranked number 38 in the world. And women, that's still a high ranking after all of those years. And here I'm telling you this because she said the same thing LeBron said. I had to go back to go forward. I'm here today on assignment from God to tell you you're pulling in all of the struggles and troubles and things around you, but you've forgotten that first moment when you went to God, when you found God, when God loved you and you loved God, you forgot that joy you had serving God. You forgot the joy you had just being a Christian. You forgot that you didn't walk into this family by yourself. God preordained you to have this anointing, this blessing, this power. I'm talking to somebody out there that God said I chose before the foundation of the world. Just like the bronze said it was his manifest destiny. I'm telling somebody with their head down, your manifest destiny is joy and victory. You just got to learn how every now and then I can't get overwhelmed by what I'm going through. I got to go back to the moments and the moment that brought me face to face with my Savior. Face to face with my God. I'm telling you right now, everybody listening to me, I want to preach to you and teach us a few minutes from Jacob about the Bethel blessing. That moment when the God who has all power in his hand, Jehovah Jireh, the God of the universe, you think it was luck that he stopped and put his brand on you, his name on you, and invited you in his family? You better sit there not realizing the power you have because of who you belong to. Somebody ought to know. I know that in this in this position that I'm in right now, it's just meaning for me to remember who I am, what I have, whose I am, and what I can do. And all I gotta do is every now and then go back to Bethel. The Bethel blessing is the favor of God in your life. And don't you forget it. Bethel is the place where God picks up the pieces of our broken lives and put them back together again if we got enough sense every now and then to go back to where we started, look back at what God promised, and just keep our faith in them. Hello, somebody. Bethel is the place where God restores and renews and rebuilds us because he knows that this world has chopped us off, has messed us up, has taken us out, out of kilter, has got us to a point where we felt like giving up. I wish I could tell you that we're living in one of the hardest times, most stressful times in the world. I heard people say that, but what I want to tell you, I don't care what kind of time it is. There's still, this time is still no match for the God that I serve. Can I get somebody to agree with me? Whatever this world can dish out, my God is greater and stronger. I feel my help coming. Whatever the enemy can do in your life, you better remember that there's a God who knows how to do it better, but you got to go back and remember who you are. Bethel is a place where God tells us that we can trust him again. That was where God puts our blessings back on track. That's what I want to tell somebody. You're just off track, but God can turn it around and put it back on track. But you got to know the impact of that first moment when you met God. Can I tell you a couple things about Bethel and then go into this text and tell you where we are? The first thing you need to understand is Bethel is a place where you first received your anointing. Understand that. Chapter 28 is where Jacob, you know, he had helped with the help of his mother. He had tricked his father out of the birthright of the firstborn, which rightfully belonged to Esau. 
But Jacob had such a desire for God that he desired the blessing. You know, sometimes a blessing that some folk have, they just toss it around like it doesn't mean much. I believe God blesses us when we when we look at the blessing and we appreciate what God has done. Can I get somebody to stop for a minute? I know you need some stuff this morning, but can you just appreciate the other stuff God has already done? Somebody ought to appreciate your right mind this morning. Somebody ought to appreciate the fact that there's a roof over your head this morning. Somebody ought to appreciate that some stuff that we don't know that you know, come on, you should have been going. There was a dark place in your life that God would not allow you to stand. Somebody ought to learn to appreciate because that's what Bethel is about. And it said that his mother then, because he, Esau was after him for stealing the birthright, they sent him to his uncle Laban. And when he went to his uncle, his mom's brother, they said, you got to leave because Esau's after you. And it was there that Jacob at Bethel actually went to sleep, and it was there that God showed up. you got to read chapter 28, verse 20, 21, where God showed up. This is where we get Jacob's ladder from. Jacob laid down to sleep in this desperate mode of running around. Can I stop for a minute? Wasn't it something that we seem to forget at that initial time we met God, the desperation that was in our life? At least we know we've had some moments where we have been good because God was able to pick us out of the condition we were in and and set our feet in a solid place. Come on. Some of us here know with the anxiety we suffered, with the problems we had in our family, with the problems we had with sickness in our body, with the problems we had with our finances, we should have fallen apart. But somehow there's a God who knows how to keep us standing. Right? Somebody, somebody still standing ought to let somebody know I'm standing by that awesome power of God. I just felt it. Somebody ought to know you're standing by God's power and nothing can knock you down if you continue to trust and believe you can stand by the power of God. But watch Jacob. Here he is by himself in the desert, running, knowing his brothers after him. And he laid down and it said, God appeared to him and gave him the blessing. He said, I'm the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. He said, I am your God. He, then he gave him the blessing that his descendants would count, would be the number of the seas and the number of the seashore, the sand on the seashore. He said, those, those blessings are going to come out of you. You are going to be blessed. I'm going to bless you and your descendants. And he pronounced the blessing of Abraham over him, or the next patriotic blessing in that line, he pronounced over Jacob. Jacob, who was already a trickster, already had some things going on. Aren't you glad, like me, that God knows how to handle tricksters? Aren't you glad God knows how to handle those of us who aren't quite right? I know I'm only talking about me, but if I got somebody out there, we'll be honest. Isn't it something that God knew what was in my heart and chose me anyhow? And what we found out was, he said to God in verse 20, he said, Lord Jacob made a vow to God. And believe it or not, you may not remember it like Jacob does distinctly in this text, but I guarantee you, you made a vow to God. Yes, you did. Jacob made a vow to God. He said, God, you will bless me. You will make sure I have food. You make sure I got raiment. He said, I will make sure I get back to my father's house in peace. Uh, Genesis 28, 20, 21. He said, you will be my God. You will be my Lord. He said, I will serve you. And then the next verse, I didn't put that one in. That's where we get where Jacob said, and I will also tie 10% of everything I get. I didn't want to throw that in because I didn't want to mess some folk up. Some folk think we're always talking about tithes. And I'm telling you the blessing of God is you got to remember that when you made that vow, you have to re, re you have to remember and reinforce and reinforce that vow. Just like when people get married, do you know one of the biggest problems I found counseling folk who are married is they think that glorious day, you know, when everybody was dressed up and it was a picture picture perfect pageantry of love and everything was going to last forever and the person stood there and you remember looking at the finest woman you ever seen and you had your big strong prince charming and you thought all we had to do was say I do. Once we said I do, that was it. Can you now be realistic and understand just because you said I do don't mean you will. <laughs> because you said I do don't mean you can. Because there will be times when that I do has to be refreshed by going back to that same moment of love. Going back to those magic moments. Because there will be some moments coming in your life where you're going to want to break out of this thing. Where it's not going to be all lovely. 
what you got to remember your vows. That's what happens when you go back to Bethel. You remember then that this wasn't all one sided. And we got to make sure when we go to God, we can't let the circumstance of our life mess us up. Andre Krauss said it best when he said, Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, where I first. I'm stopping. I'm stopping. You understand? I don't want you just running through this message. Somebody needs to go back to Bethel because you're missing the blessing that happened to you there. Because Bethel not only is a place where you got your first anointing, meaning God was going to be with you. Bethel was a place where you had your first taste of loving God. Watch what I'm saying. God showed up to Jacob. This was no longer his father's God. This was no longer just a God he heard about and was taught about. Do, do you remember the moment when God became the best thing that ever happened to you in your life? Do you remember when you sat there just dreamy-eyed looking at scripture and saying, Oh my God, on the head, not the tail. And, oh my God, if I had faith, but I must have. Do you remember the, what happened inside of you when you could say those scriptures and say, I'm a part of this great legacy of the word? Well, what happens is we got to go back to that first place because in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, you know the scripture when the seven churches of Asia Minor, when John was talking to one, here's what God said to the church in Ephesus. You know the verse. He said in verse 4 of the second chapter, he said, I got someone against you. He said, yes, you're patient. You got faith. You don't like evil. He said, but I got a problem. You're just running on autopilot because the reality is you lost your first love. You don't love me anymore. I'm not first place anymore. Go back to a place where uh, you're not serving God because he blessed you. You're serving God because uh, uh, you love him. Go to a place where worship is not something you do, but worship is who you are. Go to a place where I don't just uh, uh, worship God because of my blessing. I worship God because I just want to be in his presence. Go to a place where you, when you get back to that first place, go to a place where God is the first thing on your mind in the morning and the last thing on your mind when you lay down at night. Go to a place where you no longer are at this place where you hear, a, you pray a prayer, but have no idea, don't even believe it's going to come true. That's what we get to. When we don't have that first place love, when we lose that love for God, there's a lot of saints out there. The reason we're miserable, because you're praying for prayers that you don't even think gonna get answered. You watch other folk just to see if their prayers are gonna come true or you hope there's some spooky stuff going on, but you gotta have them. You gotta have a faith in the relationship you have with God. Say that again, Reverend. You gotta have faith in the relationship you have for God because you're the one that's gonna need to get in touch with him when you're going through your problems. Amen, somebody. But you got to get back to that place where when you pray a prayer, you expect it to come through. Or you're in church right now. No, we do. We sing songs that bring us happy, make us happy, bring us joy. But we don't bring sing songs that make us change. We listen to messages so that we can hear the preaching and say, ooh, wasn't that good preaching? Just so we can, you know, dissect the preaching and say, that was a good word. But we don't let the word do anything in our life. Bethel is a place where you got to go back to your first. And lastly, Bethel is a place where you got to go and remember that you can handle anything the devil throws at you. I want you to go to Hebrews 10, verse 32. It said, and I like this one. When the Hebrews were under all kind of persecution, the writer said to them, Remember the former days in which you were illuminated. You got your knowledge. You endured a great fight of affliction against you. Here's what he said. When you go back to Bethel, it comes to your mind. Wait a minute. I've already been through some stuff. It comes back to your mind, why am I sitting here now when I look back, go back to Bethel, some things going on, that Bethel blessing, that initial contact with God lights up my life, and I remember again that I can handle what I'm going through. i got to get out of here. we got to go to Jacob. I, I, I want to I give you the first thing that happened. Verse 35, you got to reprioritize God in your perspective of life. i, I got to tell you what I mean. Uh, we can't have this traditional perspective of God. You can't run around to the latest fad in the gospel, pick up the latest language. Uh, you can't run around just trying to 
you know, follow what the current vibe is. You got to get to the place that in your perspective, I want a real encounter with a real God. I don't want this. Do you hear what I'm saying? Many of us have never had an encounter with God. We listen to other folk prophesy. We listen to other people stand up and talk about how good God is. And some of us are part of the crowd that starts condemning what church is doing, condemning miracles, condemning what God is doing, because we never felt it ourselves, but we never felt it ourselves because our perspective of life is trying to get all the stuff we want, and that was Jacob's problem. What am I talking about? 20th chapter. He was fleeing. From his brother Esau. Going to Bethel. Leaving Bethel. Going to his brother Esau. Went through Bethel. Made an altar to God in chapter 28. Chapter 29, he got to his uncle Laban. When he got there, of course, you remember, there was Leah and Rachel. He fell in love with Rachel as soon as he saw her. And he agreed to work for his uncle for seven years so he could marry Rachel, who was the younger of the sisters. Now, Laban agreed. Jacob worked seven years. But at the end of the seven years, on the wedding night, his uncle sent Leah and Bildad into Jacob's tent, her handmaid. And when he got to Jacob's tent, Jacob went into her, slept with her. Next morning, he said, wait a minute, this is Leah. What are you doing? He asked Laban. Laban said, well, the uh, younger can't get married before the elder. If you work seven more years... I'll give you Rachel. And the Bible tells us in the 17th chapter, 29th verse, that Leah was tender-eyed. And then it said, correspondingly, Rachel was beautiful. I believe that's telling us that Rachel was fairer looking. She was the fairer of the two. But in that 29th chapter, a week later, he married Rachel. So now he's married to Leah and Rachel. Here is the first thing I want you to see why you got to go back to Bethel. In that 31st verse of the 29th chapter, I love this. The Bible said God looked and saw that Leah was being treated meanly, roughly. I love it. And so he opened her womb. Do you realize that God saw because Rachel was more beautiful, she saw Leah was being talked down to. Leah was being put down. So God said, I'm going to give her, you know, what the prizes was of that time for a woman to be able to bear children. He gave Leah that privilege before Rachel. Here's what I want you to know. God is close to those of a contract spirit. I want somebody to start rejoicing out there. If you're the one everybody's always putting down, everybody doesn't believe in. If you're the one that people say you can't make it, you ought to know you are right for a blessing. Are you the one that's going through the most problems? I wish I had a testimony. The worst problems are the ones God gives the best anointing to. All I'm saying is, God said, when you treat Leah badly, God came down and said, I'm going to handle the situation. God, get ready to handle your situation. Don't you ever get upset because of what people say to you. Then we found out in the 30th chapter, it's all about the children being born. And finally, Rachel had Joseph. Rachel had Benjamin, right? So we know she had two children. But at the end of that 30th chapter, we found that uh, Jacob had gotten rich with increase. I mean, you know the whole thing about the speckled cattle and all that. Anyway, God blessed him with favor till he was rich. The last verse of the 30th chapter says he was rich in maidservants and manservants, had many cattle. He was low. So he had more than Laban. Problems started. 31st verse. That's where we're at. The 31st chapter, excuse me, is when the real problems began to happen because it was there that we found out that Jacob, Laban's sons, very first verse of the 31st chapter said, Laban's sons said, look, Jacob then took all our father's stuff. Then Laban started looking at Jacob funny, so Jacob decided to leave. And of course, you know, one of his wives stole some of Laban's stuff when they left, but that's not what happened. So he was being chased by Laban. 
And then he got a word that Esau was coming too. Here he found himself in this predicament, predicament that his life was falling apart after all the blessings. I wish I could get you to see this. We're going back to LeBron James. Just because you were anointed once, just because your life was good once, don't mean it's going to stay that way if you don't keep going back to Bethel. If you don't keep going getting a clear picture of who you are in God. You can't live off of your used to. You can't live off of what you used to have. You can't live off of some old anointing. You got to make sure that every day you try to seek God freshly. And the Bible tells us that he ran away with his family. Chapter 32 is when Jesse, Jacob wrestled with God. You know, that was a, a turning point in his life where God was trying to show him that he was going off the wrong way because God crippled him. I don't have time, but I need you to understand something significant for you to know that some of the things God allowed in our life to cripple us is to slow us down so we don't get in something he can't get us out of. So anyway, Jacob wrestled with God, but Jacob had one thing going for him, and this is what made him steal the birthright in the first place. He said, I'm not letting go. I want to salute. I want to salute some folk. Maybe you're not the best Christian in the world, but you done made up your mind. You made up in your mind. Your tenacity is, I will not let go of God. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm not giving up. You can't pull me. Look, I might not be good, but I'm going to come repent. I'm going to be right here. When the dust clears, you're going to find me holding on to my blessing in God. See, some of y'all, you got all this anointing, but then you sit there and want to give up. There's some of us in here, we may not be that. We're, we're working toward it slowly, but you know what happens? We got this thing inside of us saying, what? No way! You must be out of your mind for me to give up my God. Jacob said, I won't let go till you bless me. That's not what we're talking about today. Look what God did. After that, Laban caught up with him in chapter 31. Him and Laban got rid of their stuff. And then in chapter 33, uh, his brother and him got rid of his stuff. But here's the problem. Stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. In chapter 31, God told him when they were talking about him, go back to the land of your fathers. His commandment was, go back to Bethel. He got him out of trouble. But instead of going to Bethel, I want you to see in the last three verses of chapter 33, he first went to Sukkoth and stayed ten years. This is what happened. God got him out of trouble, so now he was taking his wealth. He built booths, he built a house, and the first thing Jacob did was got from under the covenant of God because God never told him to build a house in Sukkot. What I'm saying is, he started seeking the stuff around him, so the sadness was he wasn't getting the stuff. Like I preach this, some of us here don't realize we broke the covenant with God because we were no longer seeking what God wanted for our life. We were no longer seeking what we made God a promise at Bethel. We were no longer seeking what God But I ain't got to pray every day. I'm going to chill here in my house in Sukkot. I'm going to speak godly words, but I ain't going to change. Not only did he stay there, the Bible said after he left Sukkot, he went to Shishim. Ten years. When he got to Shishim is when his daughter, Dinah, this chapter 34, still not going. God said, go, go, go to Bethel. He still didn't make it. How are you stopping up in all these places and then blaming God? Went to Shisham, and there his daughter Dinah was raped. His sons went back and slew a lot of folk. At the end of chapter 34, it says that the Canaanites were after them. They were outnumbering them, so he had to run with his family. But before he took a move this time, right at the text, it says, Then, somebody say then. Then God said, Jacob, arise, go to Bethel, and dwell at the place where I first appeared to you when you were running from your brother. Then, you didn't get it yet. Some of you are going to keep going around until you have a then moment. Then is when you summarize all your tears, you summarize all the trickery, you summarize all the things you try to do without God. You haven't had a then moment yet. You know how they tell you that when you're hard-headed, you can't tell somebody what to do, but sooner or later, if the right thing comes along, you'll have a then moment. Here was Jacob's then moment. He realized, God got me out of all this trouble. I'm loaded now, but I'm fleeing again. Now I'm running from my lies. I'm running because I wasn't obedient to God. 
I'm running because God said go to Bethel. I did And God said, then, I love then. Then is when I get to the moment. You know, every saying in here, I can preach to you forever until you get a then moment where you're going to pick back up the mantle of God. It does not mean a thing. Then is when your heart changes. Then is when you say, you know what? I've been half-stepping. Then is when you realize, I could have died without God. Then is when you say, I'm getting up out of this place. Then is what happened to the prodigal son when he was in the pig pen. Then, my father's servants got more than I got. Then is what happened to the woman with the issue of blood. She said, look, I don't care how much blood I drip. The then moment said, I'm going to come to God. Then is when the blessings happen. Then arise and go back to Bethel. Go back. And believe what I told you. And the Bible says that he had that then moment. And he remembered in chapter 28 when he was running. And he said, I'm not running anymore because I'm stopping now. And I'm letting God bless me. Oh, word, stop right there where you are. You know, sometimes the psalmist says, stand still. You got to stand still and just believe once you have that then moment. Go back. Look, here's what I'm trying to tell you. Quit trying to live off other folk's testimony. You got your own bin moment. You got your own Bethel moment. I don't know what happened. You have to give me my testimony. It is powerful. You had your own. All God is saying is when you reach the den, when you're tired of running, when you're tired of going your way, then you will arrive. Look at the instruction in this text. It is so awesome. He said, I need you to arise, go to Bethel, and build an altar. Why do I want you to build an altar? Because... There are some blessings, oh, watch me, that I already have for you, but I couldn't give them to you because we never connected. You never came back to me to get them. You were asking for all this other stuff, but there's some blessings I have for you, some deliverance I have for you, some healing I have for you, some things that you already asked for. Here's what God is saying. I am so supernatural. I have so much omnipotence. I have so much power. You better believe this. God said, I already have the blessing. All you got to do is show up. Here's what God is saying. I was waiting on you to come to a place, build an altar, where I can give you what I want. Somebody ready to build an altar. You need to build an altar. Come on. You're doing everything else. You got to quit trying to be natural. Build you an altar and do what God said. Stop what you're doing and build an altar somewhere. Change your mind and say, you know what, God? I'm going back to that moment when we first met. I'm going back to Bethel. Then he said, get rid of your idols. There are so many things that clamor for your attention. So many things. You know, I get tired sometimes as a preacher. I know we're in pandemic, so we got to slow down. But, you know, I only got this much time to preach. I only got this much time for God. I got time for everything else. But the problem to me is people have fallen off serving God. But the things they really want to do, they found time to do, and they made their adjustments. But they didn't make enough adjustments to church. And that's when they need to realize i got to get rid of my idols and realize it is only God who can keep me safe. We're carrying everything but God. There were some friends who decided to go on a hunting trip, and they broke into pairs. Well, it was late at night. Everybody came back except for one couple that was still out there. All of a sudden, Harry came back carrying a big buck, I mean, big rack on his head, carrying him. And they looked around and they said, well, Harry, where is John? You're carrying a deer, where's John? He said, oh, John got hurt back there on the trail. He's still laying down back there. So wait a minute, so you carried the deer instead of John? I mean, instead of, instead of John? He said, yeah. He said, why? He said, because Ain't nobody going to steal him. They might steal my deer. Funny or not funny. That's how you feel. I got to get back to my world and stuff. Somebody might steal my stuff. Somebody might take my time. Somebody might take my place. Now, so you kick God to the side. You carry everything in your life but God. You make God the last thing on your life. That's how we do it. And so we have these idols that are killing us. And so now we've forgotten the part that says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. We forgot Exodus. God said, You shall have no other gods before me. We're crying, Blessing, blessing, blessing. But God said, Where is it when you're carrying me and worshiping me? How does worship go? Verse 3 said, Let us arise and go to Bethel, build this altar. And then he said, To who? To the God who already answered me in my distress. Isn't that something? You got all this faith in your money, in your things, in the people. 
in your priorities, but none of them answered you in your distress. None of them were in the hospital bed. None of them were there when your mind was, well, you know, was empty and you were hurting. None of them were there when you couldn't sleep at night. No, you got on your knees and you prayed to a God who answered you already in your distress. All, the, all he's saying here, sometimes when you build that altar and go back to Bethel, you remember that it wasn't the foreign things that blessed me. It wasn't these other things in my life that I'm so enamored with. It's only the presence of God. Why? Because he's the one that answered me in my distress. He inhabits the praises of the people. Priority, prioritize. The second point, you've got to realize you need God's protection all the time. Look at verse 5. They journey, and the terror of God was on the cities. You know why you're here right now? You know why you didn't go all the way under? Do you know why um, you got delivered and some folk didn't? Do you know why um, some things have happened in your life? It's because God told the devil, don't touch her today. No. Get your hand off him. You know what God did? He protected you. He, he not only sent angels to guard you, but he sent an anointing over you, a protection because he knew you had so. Oh, tell me somebody. He knew you got somewhere to go right now. Somebody ought to celebrate the fact that right now God got a protection of favor over your life right now. You ought to know the reason you are there is because God said, I made the enemies around you. They were coming No matter how bad they were, God kept your enemies at bay. I like what it said, made him a terror. I think back sometimes to my BC days. I'm going to my last point. My BC days when, I'm looking at the instructions, right? We got the instruction, right? First thing, we prioritize God in my perspective, by what I think. Then I got to make sure I understand. I need God's protection because if I go any other direction, it won't protect me. That's why I'm running now. I got to get back to Bethel. But I remember I was singing in bands. And I shared with you one night, well, a couple of times, there was a shooting in the club. We were up on stage, and the bullets whistled by us. Other folk got shot, but I did not. I never thought about the fact that God was preserving me for now. God preserved you. Everybody who knows God preserved me, just put it in there. He preserved me. Everybody who knows that God has, has, has you seen some things in your life that you know you wouldn't have escaped without God. I've seen some silly things I've done. God let me live through. Is there anybody else? So God said, you got to understand that you need my protection. And when you put anything else ahead of God, because if you look what happened, uh, Deborah's, uh, Rebecca's nurse died, and she was buried in Bethel under a tree. I like this because it's telling us that along the way, God will provide, give us provisions of things that are more needful than the things we have of this world. Let's get to the last point. It starts in verse 9. After he went back to Bethel and he was obedient, the Bible says that God appeared to Jacob again. And when he came to Bandem Aram, he blessed him. And God said to him, Wow. Your name is Jacob. Look at how God said this. Your name shall be called Jacob no more, but Israel shall be your name. He said, look, I called you Israel when I crippled you. Now when your heart got right, you really are Israel. Israel means you have power with God. You have authority with God. Can I stop? Somebody listening to me, you did not tune in so I could preach you happy. What I hope you tuned in was to stir up, as Paul told Timothy, that gift that's already in you. Can I prophesy all life? You got enough you got enough anointing in your life to bless you now. You got enough anointing that if you stood up and said a prayer, whatever is hindering you has to let go of you. Whatever demonic force is over your family, you can stand up and speak the word of God and your voice commit with, commit, com, commin, commingled with God, excuse me, committed to God and commingled with God's power in you can divorce you from any problem that's happening in your life. You got to believe that God not only shows up and does natural stuff, he's a supernatural God waiting on you to act like you're a supernatural child that belongs to a supernatural God and speak your way out. Quit waiting on other people to pray you out. Pray your own self out. Get your own self out of God's stuff. I like what the Lord said in the word of God. I love what Hebrews 4 16 said. Go boldly to the throne of grace and find help. You can't come at God all weak and timid. You gotta shake yourself. It may hurt but you gotta let yourself know. I'm going back to get my Bethel blessing. Then I'm gonna act on my Bethel. 
got the blessing. I'm going to walk in the name God called me. And the name God called me is a name of power. You got power. You got power. But you got to be bold enough to go to God. He said, I'm going to call you Jacob. I'm closing. Watch this. And then he said, God went up from this place where he had talked with him. So Jacob arose and did a drink offering. And he spoke to God in a place that he once again called Bethel. Bethel is a place where I believe all things possible. Bethel is a place where everything can be turned around. Bethel is a place where I don't sit around crying as if I'm hopeless. Bethel is a place where I start looking back up to the God who delivered me last time, to the God where I first met. You remember when you first met him? That first time when you figured out who it was you were serving, when you figured out all your life was created for this moment. Anybody like me? I know I was created for this moment. You were created for this moment. This battle you're in now is just one of the battles. God already gave you power. Psalm 55 and 22 says, Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. Go back to Bethel. Reprioritize your perspective. Realize you need God's protection. I'm literally, you got this right. And then when you get to the point where you realize all God had done, receive the restoration of your providence. Right? You already have a providential life covered with favor. But in order to get to it, I don't know what you need, but go back to Bethel. And God will do it. Somebody give God a praise offering. He will restore that miracle covenant. If you remember, I'm not what the enemy says I am. I'm what God created me. This is Pastor Duncan saying God bless you. Tune in uh, to our broadcast. Share the word. Let somebody else know that we're out there. And continue to pray for us so that we can give you a pure, unadulterated view of the word of God. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for praying. Thanks for watching. Leave it, I was down, but with no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing, but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free.